Now this morning I, I want to uh, bring to you one key or central thought that in a sense binds up and unites together all of the teaching that we have observed in this chapter and the preceding chapters that deal particularly with the life of King Ahab, his wife uh, Jezebel, and of course the people of Israel over whom they reign. We have been led in this chapter into a very sensitive area of their personal lives. For not only have we watched them on the battlefield and in the persuasions of their military focus and agenda and might, but we have also had a little glimpse into the inner chamber of the palace and in particular the inner chamber of their heart. We have seen the king exposed as never before. A man who on one occasion speaks with bravado against the opposing king of Syria, refusing to be moved in his resolve not to hand over the priceless possessions of his people to this foreign king. But now we picture him quietly musing in his palace chamber, lying upon his bed in the huff, mourning because he has not been permitted to have his way and achieve and gain what he desires to possess, namely the vineyard of his neighbor Naboth. There stands in contrast the frustrations of a worldly man who cannot get enough. And on the other side, there is the quiet, calm confidence of a man who values the little that he has in the understanding that he has received this as a gift from God. Naboth wants to hold on to his possession because it is his inheritance. He will not, he cannot offer it up or hand it over or yield it to the impulse of a man who cares nothing for the word of God, does not desire to walk in the ways of God, and has little intent on coming before the altar to worship the Lord. So this chapter brings, as it were, the general focus to a pivotal point where we now see in a new way what has already been displayed through the word of the prophet Elijah on Mount Carmel. We see the forces of good against evil. We see the power of a false god, Baal, opposing the power of Jehovah, the God of Israel. Now, in this um, passage, we see man at his best in the life of Naboth. We also see man, or could I suggest woman, at their worst. For Jezebel, who shares and not only has imparted her support to King Ahab in his wild and foolish escapades, but has also been instrumental in most of the exploits, particularly as they sought to elevate false worship, pagan worship, and to demote 
the worship of God. She now observes that her husband, the king, is um, in a very poor state of mind because he has not been permitted to have what he wants, to get his way, and to take possession of the vineyard of Naboth. So she has determined that in her usual manner, she will try to manipulate the circumstances to bring about the possession of this vineyard for King Ahab. After all, he is the king. He is entitled to have anything and everything that he wants, even though that may contradict or oppose what God wants. Isn't that true of the picture presented by the prophet Isaiah when he writes in that 53rd chapter, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, even though that contradicts the way of God. And so we find as the chapter proceeds, she initiates a banquet and she sets up by way of communicating through a letter uh, that uh, at this banquet they appear to honor Naboth. And then out of nowhere, two braggards or scoundrels, as they are called, will testify falsely that Naboth has uh, blasphemed the king. That's treason. And has also blasphemed the God that he is uh, reputed and supposed to represent. Knowing that the penalty for either one of these, according to the law, would be taken out and stoned. It matters not that Israel have not been observing God's law for some time, but when it suits, she wants the law to be applied. And so as they enact all that she has uh, required and requested, and Naboth has been slain, she then arouses Ahab from his bed and tells him to go down and take possession of the vineyard that he wants because Naboth has uh, no longer the ability to stand in his way because Naboth is dead. Elijah, however, is still on the scene. For some time his voice has been silent. For some time he has not been that thorn in the side of Ahab. But now God raises him up again with a challenge to go down to Ahab and confront him. This time it is a simple proclamation. It is a declaration. There is no extension of grace or of mercy. This is a simple statement of the judgment of God. You see, there is a time when God permits us to have an extension, even though we rebel violently against him. There is a time that God will not come and punish our sin immediately or completely. It is referred to as a day of mercy and of grace. But there will always be a time when grace and mercy will be withdrawn and the judgment of God will be pronounced upon sinners. Go back to the early chapters of Genesis. Read there of the time of the flood. Read of how the ark was being built 
And God confirmed right at the beginning of that period and process that he would allow them 120 years before the floods would come. But God insisted, my spirit shall not always strive with man. So now the day has come. For Ahab, it would appear to be a glorious day, a day of fulfillment for him, a day when he is able to take possession of this new desire. But on that same day, just like in the New Testament account of the rich man, the rich farmer, who looked around his fields and saw them heavy laden with crop, and he decided, I'll pull down my barns, I'll build greater. And when I filled my barns to capacity, I will say to my soul, eat, drink, and be merry. You have much goods led up for many years. But that night, there came the voice to determine his destiny. You fool, this night your soul shall be required of you. Ahab is standing in the middle of his vineyard surveying what he now owns. And in the shadow stands the prophet who will soon come boldly forth and declare to Ahab that while he may set his own future, while he may plan for the way that he will live, there is another who holds even the heart of the king in his hand. And so the prophet Elijah stands forth and pronounces a threefold sentence of judgment and of death upon King Ahab and wicked Queen Jezebel. Look at verse 19 of chapter 21. The message is that in the same place, For the dogs had licked the blood of Naboth. Dogs would come and lick the blood of Ahab. Look at verses 21 to 22 and then into 24 of chapter 21. And there you'll read that all the male descendants of Ahab would be destroyed. Again in verse 23 of chapter 21, dogs would devour the body of Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Notice the irony of this. She deprived Naboth of his land in order to build the wealth of the kingdom and of the king. But as she denied that parcel of land to Naboth, God denied her a parcel of land even to be buried in. And so now, The fulfillment of all this is to be expected and when we come into chapter 22 we will begin to discover how God brings this all about in circumstances and in ways that were not thought credible or possible at this particular time. But while the scoffers mock and the critics criticize the Scriptures, 
The word of God stands steadfast and true and sure. God honors his word. The dogs we read lick up Ahab's blood in verse 38 of chapter 22. We go over into 2 Kings chapter 9 and read through the chapter into the 10th chapter, verse 17, and we discover that the male descendants all die and Jezebel herself dies in the manner that the prophet Elijah has predicted. I've mentioned this before. Here we have the law of divine retribution. Be sure your sin will find you out. As we have done unto others, so will be done unto us. They who live by the sword will perish by the sword. Come with me to the book of Judges. The book of Judges, chapter 1. Judges, chapter 1. Note in verse 1. After the death of Joshua, it came to pass the children of Israel asked the Lord, saying, Who shall be first to go up for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? And the Lord said, Judah shall go up. Indeed, I have delivered the uh, land into his hand. So Judah said to uh, Simeon, his brother, Come up with me to my allotted territory, that we may fight against the Canaanites. And I will likewise go with you to your allotted territory. And Simeon went with him. Then Judah went up, and the Lord delivered the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand. And they killed 10,000 men at Bezek. And they found Adonai Bezek, Adonai meaning Lord or King Bezek, in Bezek, and fought against him. And they defeated the Canaanites and the Perizzites, Then Adonai Bezek fled, and they pursued him, and caught him, and cut off his thumbs and big toes. Why did they do that? The thumb was the symbol of holding a weapon. Severing the thumb meant that the enemy was now subdued, could not fight anymore. The big toe was symbolic of running or fleeing or escaping. So here they take Adonai Bezek, cut off his thumbs and big toes, and note what Adonai Bezek said. Seventy kings with their thumbs and big toes cut off, used to gather scraps under my table, As I have done, so God has repaid me. We do well to take heed to the warnings of Scripture. We turn them aside and we mock them at our peril. And here now the prophet Elijah is revealing to the king, that his days are numbered. He may turn aside, thwart the purpose of God, lead Israel into the bondage of pagan worship, but there is coming a day of accountability when he will stand before God in judgment. Come over to Galatians chapter 6. Note the teaching of the Apostle Paul. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 and 8. 
Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. We reap whatever we sow. Now having acknowledged this golden rule, the author pauses for just a moment. If you look at verse 25 and 26 of 1 Kings 21, you'll see that Ahab's character is now revealed to us. That is the depth of his personality, all that makes him what he is, the man that he is. Not just the one on the battlefield perceived to be a mighty warrior, not the one who lies upon his bed sulking in a state of depression because he cannot have his own way. But here is the real root of the character of the man, the king. There are two things we're told about him. Look, first of all, at verse 25. There was no one like Ahab, and here it is, who sold himself to do wickedness in the sight of the Lord. He sold himself to do wickedness in the sight of the Lord. Uh, how are we to understand that thought? Come over into Second Peter for a moment. Second Peter chapter 2. We want to read verse uh, 12 through to verse 16. But these, like natural brute beasts, made to be caught and destroyed, speak evil of the things they do not understand. Just pausing there for one moment, let me take you over into the first chapter of Romans. There is a descriptive understanding of the state of, of the nation today. The lifestyle that has been accepted and adopted is a result of two things. One, they do not understand. The foolish mind is darkened. And the second is that they have sold themselves to sin. Now let's come back to 2 Peter 2 and uh, verse 12. Speak evil of the things they do not understand and will utterly perish in their own corruption and will receive the wages of unrighteousness. What are the wages of unrighteousness? Romans chapter 6 verse 23 tells us the wages of sin is death. Let's read a little further. As those who count it pleasure to carouse in the daytime, they are spots and blemishes carousing in their own deceptions while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery, and here is the point, that cannot cease from sin. They are sold to sin. They cannot 
cease from it. And so the world waxes worse and worse as their corruption grows. They have a heart trained in covetous practices and are accursed children. They have forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. But he was rebuked for his iniquity. A dumb donkey speaking with a man's voice restrained the madness of the prophet. Here is Ahab, sold under sin. We could think of others. Remember Judas, who betrayed Christ, who went off to search out the chief priests so that for financial gain he would sell Jesus to them. So here we read that Ahab was weak, but look at verse 25. Perhaps this shows just how weak he was. Who sold himself to do wickedness in the sight of the Lord, because Jezebel his wife stirred him up. Not only was he wicked, but he is weak. The point that's made here is simply that an unregenerate heart has no resistance or resilience against the temptation to sin. We cannot fight against sin in our own strength. We are born in sin, shaping in iniquity. And if we don't yield our sinful heart to Christ and he comes to dwell within us, then we will fall to the temptations of the world. Notice how that comes out in the life of Ahab. Verse 26, he behaved very abominably in following idols according to all that the Amorites had done, whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. So now the prophet Elijah justifies the condemnation that God has brought and the challenge of the final end of the entire royal community, Ahab, Jezebel, and their descendants because of their wickedness and their sin. But what happens now appears to be rather strange on the horizon of this particular focus. Notice in verse 27 how King Ahab responds to this challenge. Here is the wicked king who has led the nation into sin. And as soon as he hears that God is going to hold him to account, the first thing he does is he tries to become religious. Turn over a new leaf. Read verse 27. So it was when Ahab heard those words that he tore his clothes and put sackcloth on his body and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went about mourning. These were things that the repentant Israelite did when they came to worship God and acknowledged their sin. So the question now becomes, how did this affect Ahab? Was this a genuine repentance? Was this something that is now about to change his life? How will God respond 
to this kind of attitude and action. Look down at verse 29, and we're told there what God said uh, to the prophet Elijah. See how Ahab has humbled himself before me. Does this mean that Ahab is now forgiven? That there is a genuine repentance that all will be well and God will not hold to the promise that he has made. Well, let's just notice what uh, happens as the passage continues. There is no record of Ahab ever rebuking or denouncing Jezebel for her actions. Remember, she has been the means for the death of Naboth and for the possession now being available for King Ahab. There is not one word of rebuke or chastisement from Ahab to point out the error of Jezebel. There is no evidence that he tried in any way to curb her wickedness and the evil of her intentions. Then come into chapter 22 and look at verse 6. The king of Israel, that is Ahab, gathered the prophets together about 400 men, and said to them, Shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to fight, or shall I refrain? So they said, Go up, for the Lord will deliver it into the hand of the king. Who are these 400 prophets? Look at verse 7. And Jehoshaphat said, is there not still a prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of him? Why would you want to go to 400 prophets of Baal, having already been shown and it been demonstrated and proved on the mountain with Elijah that the prophets of Baal cannot evoke any evidence of life in the prophet or, or in the God that they worship. Why would you go to 400 false prophets? Let's try and find one good prophet like Elijah who will tell us the truth in light of what is happening. But Ahab is still bound to the false worship, and he's under the jurisdiction of the false prophets. So there is no evidence that comes through in these final chapters that uh, he has turned over a new leaf in the sense that he has uh, focused upon the internal need to react to the Word of God, and to reach out, to have a relationship with God. On the surface, he appears to be repentant, but in his heart, Ahab is still the same. Now, we could go through many scriptures this morning to read how this <clears throat> eventuates, how this becomes an issue of pretense, uh, an issue of hypocrisy, where religion is gathered like a cloak to bring a sense of security and identity to those who lay hold upon it, but having an outward, external uh, witness. There is no change in the heart, and it becomes a profession without a true possession. It is easy to say, I am a Christian, but it's a different matter to prove that 
by our lives, the way that we live, and the way that we worship. And so, in this 29th verse of 1 Kings 21, God said to Elijah, See how Ahab has humbled himself before me, because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring the calamity in his days. In the days of his sons, I will bring the calamity on his house. Three prophecies. One involved Ahab. That will soon be fulfilled. Another involved Jezebel that also will soon be fulfilled. The prophecy relating to the house of Ahab, to his descendants, would not be fulfilled presently, currently, but will be fulfilled decisively at a time appointed by God because God's word will always be fulfilled. Now let me just conclude, lest you go home disappointed on this Resurrection Sunday morning. What about Naboth? Poor Naboth has lost everything. Even his life. Now, how much worse can it be? A man comes along and steals your possessions. He leaves you with nothing. That is something not one of us would like to even anticipate. But what if someone comes and steals your possessions and also steals your life? Could that be the worst thing out? Would you rather be in Naboth's shoes or in the shoes of King Ahab? If we were to look at things simply in the light and the context and the culture of today, we would probably all say, well, I would rather, I would rather still have life and put it to good use than to be dead. But is death? the worst that can happen to a true believer? Come with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. We want to read from verse 3 down to verse 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Everything that we long for Everything we aspire to, everything that satisfies our lives, not only here and now, but projected into the future, has already been provided for and guaranteed through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, let's notice what verse 4 tells us to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. So Naboth had two inheritances. One handed down by his forefathers, given to his family, under divine law. That was his earthly possession. 
he refused to sell it or to give it to the king because the law forbade that to happen. He was given this as a gift from God. It was his. He was a steward, and he would hand it down to his descendants. But he had another inheritance. The inheritance that he wanted to have and to hold and to give to his descendants was cruelly and unjustly taken away from him. But there was another inheritance, and it was in heaven. And what does this text tell us? It's incorruptible. It doesn't matter how long it takes for you and I, if we trust wholly and fully in Jesus, it doesn't matter which generation we are born into and at what point we die, the inheritance in heaven will never, ever corrupt. It is reserved for us. When was it reserved for us? Before the world began. And what about this inheritance? It does not fade away. It is reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God. What power of God? The power that raised Jesus up from the dead, who were kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last day. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you've been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith be much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. That is the inheritance reserved in heaven for the people of God, purchased by the death of Christ on the cross of Calvary, claimed through the resurrection of Christ from the dead. And you and I, who truly believe are being kept by the power of God, even though the wickedness of the world may hurl its insults upon us. We may have a life fraught with dangers on every hand, as the devil stalks our footstep as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. But should they strip every possession from us, should they lay our bruised and battered bodies in the soil? One thing is sure. On this Resurrection Sunday morning, we have a hope beyond the grave. We have an inheritance reserved in heaven for us. Ahab comes under the pronouncement of death, yet he will still live for a little season. Naboth has come under the anticipation of life, although his body lies cold in death. And this morning you and I must understand and recognize that we fall into one of these two categories of those who are 
alive in the world and engaged in the world and sold unto sin. But in our heart there is the coldness of death. And we shall never gain an entrance to heaven where the inheritance of the saints awaits. But rather we shall be condemned to hear the voice of Christ declare, Depart from me. I never knew you. And out into the darkness of an eternal death we go for the worm dies not and the fire is not quenched. Or we have died to sin. We have yielded our lives to Christ. We are his. And we know that whatever life may bring, we shall never die. For Jesus declared, because I live, you shall live also. And why do we know that we will live? Because there is already an inheritance waiting for us in heaven. And the one who planted that inheritance there is the one who writes, our name in the book of life. And there they remain eternally secure. And to bring the promise into full fruition, God by his Spirit now holds us, keeps us from falling, and in our heart plants that assurance that whatever life may bring, our citizenship is in heaven. Have you put your trust in the risen Christ today? Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word and pray that you will continue to encourage our hearts in its truth. May your Spirit guide and direct us so that we will not falter, nor fear, nor will we fold to life's temptations and its woes. Help us not to be shaken or stirred. Help us not to be condemned because we have chosen to live in sin, for sin, but, Father, help us to see how vile and wicked a life without Christ is. Help us to understand the bitter end of those who die in their sins. And by your Spirit, lead us to Calvary, there to behold Christ the Savior dying in our stead, giving his life pain with his blood, that we might be redeemed and reconciled to a holy God. And where there has been a trust in the church or in religion or our own good efforts or deeds, help us to submit to the knowledge that they are all as filthy rags in your sight. Help us to see that Christ alone can save and give us grace to call upon the name of the Lord that we may be saved. Teach us how to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior in order that we may know with assurance that we have an inheritance among the saints. We pray in our Saviour's name. Amen.